Hello. In this video, we are going to analyze Feza Kashani's approach to attaining knowledge, specifically his perspective towards philosophy, mysticism, and theology. Welcome to episode number two of the Feza Kashani series, the video series in which we examine the thought of the 17th century Iranian polymath. In this video, we are going to see how he harmonizes reason, spirituality, and theology. What makes Feza Kashani unique is that Unlike some Sufis who uh, reject reason altogether and resort only to spirituality, or unlike those philosophers who reject spirituality altogether and uh, focus on reason alone, Feza Kaushani harmonizes the two and uses this harmony, this synthesis, in approaching the Quran and the Islamic tradition. I'm a scholar of philosophy, mysticism, Persian poetry, and philosophy of religion. And one of the things that bother me when I read Islamic mysticism, Sufism, is that some thinkers reject one of the two sides, reason or spirituality, in attaining uh, divine knowledge, which makes him so relevant to our time. We are in need of spirituality and we are in need of reason. And Feza Kashani provides us with both in a very unique and elegant way. Examining his perspective, we are going to start with a poem. Not that I'm basing his entire thought on this poem, but this is a good starting place. We're going to analyze his other works and see how, how this poem fits into his body of works. But let's first read the poem in Farsi and, uh, and analyze it in English. <laughs> دست طلب بعد از آن در کمر ذکر زن می بردد فکر و ذکر در راه عرفان و انس تا به محبت کشد کار دل و جان و تن چون به محبت رسی جذب رسد آن طرف تا کشدت سوی خود تا رهی از خیشتن What does this poem mean and how is it going to help us? Let me first give you an overview. Um, according to Faiz, um, the truth seeker must first start with reason. He says, uh, the seeker must persistently reflect, that is, use their rational faculty, until it peaks in a state of profound awe and bewilderment. What in Islamic tradition, special, specifically mystical tradition, is called hayrat in Farsi, hayrat, that is, bewilderment. Um, so this underscores the limitations of uh, rational reflection. You start with reason, you start with philosophy, you come to a point. But when you reach examining deep spiritual truth, specifically when you reach examining uh, the divine essence, you will realize that reason alone is incapable of giving you all the answers, of understanding the, of understanding the divine essence fully. So Faith says, start with philosophy, come to some point when you get to that bewilderment stage. There you need to take another step. What is that step? He says, then the seeker should contemplate God continuously and uh, attentively. Well, he literally uses the word uh, dhikr, dhikr, which means remembrance, continuous contemplation of divine names. But here it has a generic meaning. Uh, here, dhikr means mystical contemplation, that is, meditating spiritual truth or divine names or divine qualities continuously. Here, contemplation has a mystical sense. And let me give you uh, a more precise definition. In its mystical sense, contemplation is a deep intuitive journey, transcending logical reasoning, culminating in recognizing the real as the sole real being. It demands concentrated and deliberate meditation on spiritual, intangible matters, frequently encompassing a state of mystical cognizance of a superior power or a god, realized through consistent meditation and solitary devotion. This aspect is how dhikr, or remembrance, is enacted in Islamic mysticism, wherein an individual recurrently utters divine names or qualities, attributes, meditating on their inner realities with focused attention. So according to Faiz, this blend of reason and mysticism where you start with philosophy, you get to the point of uh, bewilderment, um, ultimately guides the seeker to a higher state of knowledge or gnosis, erfan, and 
intimacy with the divine. Reaching this level, the seeker will realize an initial stage of love towards the divine, which Feza Kashani calls muhabbat in Farsi. When muhabbat, an initial degree of divine love, appears in the seeker's heart, a stronger love appears following that. So the first stage of muhabbat comes and it pulls through time a stronger divine grace, a stronger form of love, which he calls jazba or jazbe in Farsi, divine attraction. So I'm going to repeat that part. When muhabbat, an initial degree of love, appears in the seeker's heart, a divine attraction emanating from the beyond pulls the seeker towards God, liberating them from their individual self. See how elegantly and systematically Feza Kashani combines reason with mysticism and gives it a poetic, emotive theme, combining it with divine love. Let us now categorize what Fez just said. I'm going to put them into six steps. Um, the, seeker be the seeker begins with the reflection and realizing reason's inherent limitations. Step two, practices constant contemplation of God. Step three, the infusion of rational reflection and mystical contemplation cultivates muhabbat, an initial degree of love. And once this love is found, step number four, the divine attraction, jazbe, a stronger form of love, which we'll elaborate, appears in the seeker's heart. Step number five, because of this mysterious pull, the seeker becomes selfless. And six, subsequently unites with the divine. So this is a breakdown of the poem and uh, we are going to, in this video and in the following ones, analyze this video in the context of um, his other works because this is not just the poem in some corner he writes and moves on. This is the framework that you see even in his prose and we are going to analyze his treatises and other works to see how it fits. In his treatise, Sharh al-Sadr, he has this uh, intriguing analogy. He compares acquiring knowledge to acquiring nourishment. He says, the food that you receive depends on your health, your body's health. The same food that nourishes a person who is healthy is harmful to a person who is sick. It is the same food, but what matters and what differs is the body that food ends up in. Is it prepared? Is it healthy? That is the question. And he uses this analogy about spiritual knowledge. He says spiritual knowledge is not good for everyone in their first step. You cannot just start um, practicing mysticism today and uh, tomorrow you will have all, all, all the mystical knowledge. Not only you are not going to get that because it's a divine grace and uh, the divine gives it, but few exceptions that uh, get such knowledge uh, instantly. But generally, you are not going to get that. It's uh, a progression. It's a journey. Uh, not only it's not going to happen, but if it happened, it's harmful for you. He says in this in this treatise, he said because you don't have the preparedness, you are not ready. And in order for you to get ready, you should take these steps. Reason, sharpening your mind, your cognitive faculty. Following that, practicing theology, mysticism, going through practices, which we will uh, elaborate further. And then, and only then, you will be ready by purifying your heart um, to receive the divine knowledge. So, to receive spiritual knowledge, you go through philosophy, you go through mystical knowledge, theoretically, through books, you read, you learn, then you start practicing. Then you practically contemplate God. Going through these, uh, all these purify your heart. This is not a stranger to those who read ancient Greek philosophy. It says like philosophy purifies the heart, philosophy purifies the soul. And the readers of Islamic uh, mysticism and metaphysics, in which it's a common notion that uh, mysticism, the whole point of mysticism is to cleanse your cleanse your soul, purify your heart, so that you receive the knowledge. Because the human heart not the physical one, of course. Human heart is the place that you receive divine manifestations. You take the necessary steps, you purify your heart, you are ready to receive the knowledge. But you don't decide the time. It's a divine grace. Not to be mistaken that following these steps, 
at time x starting from your first point you will get this knowledge um, here if i may quote ibn arabi in his futuhat al makkiya he says you keep knocking that door but you are not the person who decides when the door will be opened it is the divine the divine beloved you keep knocking the grace will come from beyond in his treatise Sharh Sadr, he categorizes scholars into three groups. And this is this is important. This is one of the things that um, was very attractive to me when I was reading Faiz. Uh, the first group is those who confine themselves to exoteric knowledge, let's say philosophy alone or the natural sciences. According to Faiz, their lack of broader understanding precludes them from leadership, the leadership of society or seekers of truth. They cannot comprehend the nuances of this world and the hereafter. The second group are those scholars who solely devote themselves to esoteric knowledge. Some Sufis who reject reason altogether, saying that everything is practical, everything is inner knowledge. He rejects them as well. Faith says, while respected, they are deemed unable to enlighten others or ascend to leadership with few exceptions. Given that, says Faiz, esoteric knowledge alone fails to perfect the seeker. Yes, the inner aspect of, uh, of the tradition is important, but so is the exoteric aspect. We will see more of that. The third category is scholars integrating exoteric and esoteric knowledge. He likens them to the sun. Such people illuminate the world and emerge as potential leaders and spiritual guides. He complements this uh, framework in his other treatise, Al Muhakama. He delineates two paths. Um, the first path is the uh, one for knowledge seekers, Ahl Ilm in Farsi, and the second group is the ascetics, Ahl Zuhd. The first group, the knowledge seekers, um, practice inner asceticism through reflection, through learning and devotedness. The second group, the ascetics, practice physical asceticism via dhikr, remembrance, night prayer and voluntary hunger, preparing and purifying their soul and heart. Faiz respects both groups, but he prioritizes uh, the first group, uh, those of the knowledge seekers, instead of mere worldly detachment and those were just practicing uh, physical asceticism. And he pays particular esteem, again in this treatise, to those scholars who beneficially apply their acquired knowledge, giving it a practical sense. The scholars should not be just uh, theoretically, abstractly be dealing uh, with, with, with the truth. They should bring the principles that they have learned and acquired into their life. It becomes an existential enlightenment for them, not just uh, philosophical abstractions or mystical theories. And he emphasizes this matter uh, through a hadith from the fifth Shi'i Imam, Imam Baqir alayhi salam. According to this Imam, a scholar who benefits from his knowledge is better than 70,000 worshippers. Furthermore, Faiz asserts that, this is, this is very interesting, Faiz asserts that individuals who combine the pursuit of knowledge and ascetic practices ascend higher than those devoted solely to seeking knowledge. So first he brought two categories, those of the ascetics or those of the knowledge seekers. He said, look, those of the knowledge seekers is better. But then immediately he says, well, sure, this one is better, but why not combine them? When you combine seeking knowledge with ascetic practices, you are elevated to a station higher than uh, mere uh, knowledge seekers. So theory, plus practice. Strangely, uh, despite um, adhering to Akhbari approach in Hadith, um, he is quite proficient in philosophy and mysticism, which is a deviation from the majority of the Akhbari-minded uh, Hadith scholars. They prioritize the Hadith in a literal sense, mostly. And they are usually not good with philosophy and mysticism, but despite adhering to that tradition, uh, Faiz is an excellent philosopher and a mystic. In his treatise Al-Insaf, he establishes a direct correlation between an individual's faith, understanding Quranic and Hadith studies on the one hand, and on the other, their theological, mystical, and philosophical learning. In other words, for Faiz Kashani, theology 
mysticism, that is Irfan, and philosophy are tools to understand the Quran and Hadith better. This synthesis of uh, rational sciences with theology and spiritual sciences is quite alive in Shi'i religious schools in Iran, especially in Qom. And this perspective has its roots in Islamic philosophy as well. Uh, Ibn Rushd, for example, Averroes, um, he also was an advocate of um, the synthesis of reason and scripture, theology in general. Um, you know, and at that time, there were people who were opposing philosophy, trying to alienize philosophy from the theological religious studies entirely. Averroes did not see animosity between the two domains. In his famous work, Tahafut al-Tahafut, Ibn Rushd says, philosophy is not a rival, but a means to delve deeper into and interpret the divine knowledge in the scripture. For Ibn Rushd, the intellect is a gift, a divine gift to decipher God's creation and intentions, positioning philosophical and religious exploration as an inherent human responsibility. According to Ibn Rush, despite the perceived contradictions and animosity between the two domains, um, a profound understanding of philosophy and scripture theology weakens this distinction and animosity. Yes, there are different domains, but for Ibn Rush, quite like uh, Fizika Shani, uh, philosophy and reason are means to decipher the Quran and the universe. Coming back to Fizika Shani, he has uh, a very interesting intellectual trajectory. Initially, he was predominantly jurisprudential, uh, but through time, he got more interested in Irfan. So even his uh, jurisprudential works were Irfani, Irfan mysticism, mysticism. So he wrote jurisprudential works that had a mystical theme. Nevertheless, his growing inclination towards Shia hadith led him to distance himself from Sufism. Not Irfan, not mysticism, Shi'i mysticism, but from Sufism, and opposed the Ijtihad and Usuli approaches, i.e., personal juristic reasoning in Hadith. So we, we've analyzed this in our previous episode. Um, so if you have missed that, it's better to watch that uh, to understand Fez Kashani's uh, perspective towards Sufism. He doesn't oppose Sufism per se, he is uh, opposing pseudo-Sufi practices and pseudo-Sufi masters. As Zargar points out in his paper Revealing Revisions, Faith's later works show a clear connection to the Quran and Shi'i Hadith, indicating a shift from Sufism towards Shi'i approach, although Faith continued to value Sufi cosmology. To Faith Kashani, all esoteric knowledge, all esoteric knowledge is sourced from the Quran and from the teachings of Ahl al-Bayt, peace be upon them, that is, the Prophet and his family, uh, which, according to uh, Shi'i school of thought, are the possessors of um, divine knowledge, or they possess the perfect intellect. Interestingly, uh, towards the end of his life, in his treatise Al-Insaf, Faith expresses disappointment with a substantial time devoted to his earlier studies, portraying himself this is very important. We also discussed this in the previous video, portraying himself as estranged from theologians, philosophers, and Sufis who do not adhere to the Quran, Hadith, and the teachings of Ahl al-Bayt. So he is still a philosopher, a mystic, not a Sufi, uh, an Arif, for the distinction, see the previous video, please. And, um, an Islamic scholar, but the difference being that uh, he considers the source of the Quran and the teachings of Ahl al-Bayt. These are the sources. How you better interpret, profoundly interpret these sources goes back to your philosophical, theological, and mystical skills and abilities and practices. In other words, Faiza Karshani subordinates theology, philosophy, and mysticism to the Quran, Hadith, and the teachings of Ahl al-Bayt. Let us conclude this, this video uh, in one paragraph. Uh, Faith Kashani meticulously synthesized emotional and intellectual journeys in pursuing spiritual ascension, illustrating that divine love is not only an emotional understanding, but also evolves through deliberate reflection and contemplation. 
despite his seeming adherence to Akhbari tradition. He is willing to integrate rational and philosophical insights, proposing that enriching one's understanding of divine knowledge is achievable through a blend of faith, understanding, theological, Gnostic, and philosophical pursuits. Faith thereby crafts a pathway through love, reflection, knowledge, harmonizing emotional depth and rational inquiry to navigate toward the divine adeptly. Thank you very much for watching this video. Um, our next videos in this series, our next episodes will be about divine wine and love, about attraction, jazba, about mystic intoxication or masti in Farsi, and uh, the following selflessness. In this episode, to some extent, we talked about attraction, divine attraction, but we did not get into it in a technical and detailed way. That requires uh, a whole new episode, so please stay tuned for the following episodes.